Okay, we're back. We're live. It's uh, 11 o'clock rock on a given Friday with the, with the global guys. We have the global guys here today. Uh, Ray Tsuchiyama, uh, he's an informed citizen. That's all he wants to tell you. We, we'll be examining him about that. Okay, and uh, of course, our old friend Russell Liu, uh, a lawyer with Shepard Mullen in Beijing. Been there 13 years. Yeah. Uh, that's why I call him the global guy. Both of these guys have been around the block. Today we're going to talk about eyes on China and Japan here on Asia in Review. Welcome to the show, you guys. Thank well, you very much. Thank you. Ni hao. Mm. Ni hao. Konnichiwa. Ohayou gozaimasu. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. <laughs> United Nations. <laughs> right here at, at Think Tank. So, you have a specific area you want to cover. Russell, can you articulate that? Yes, um, we, we'd like to cover, um, on our, based on our ops to Ray and myself, We've been in, in Asia for a number of years. Ray has been there longer than I am. Ray has been executive uh, with a software company in, in Tokyo for 20 years. Uh, and I've lived in Beijing for 13 years working with law firms, also teaching law schools to Chinese lawyers who study common law. So w what we want to do is we want to share observations on s what's happening in Asia, Japan and China, the relationship between the people between China and Japan, uh, the, the way business is done, um, and our observation of, of some prediction of where it's going to go. And again, tied it together, how does it relate to Hawaii? We're both local boys, born and raised in Hawaii. And so our observations are a little unique. And, and from what we see, you know, we hopefully that, that some of the things that we share, our shared knowledge, will, will, will resonate the community and how to build platforms to become more global with Asia in mind, Japan and China. So, so that's why we're here. I think what you, what you, you imply, though, that the relationship um, between China and Japan, and for that matter, Hawaii, has been a certain way for many years, but that there is a dynamic happening now uh, in the world. So can you first discuss the way it has been over the years, and then can you talk about the change? Sure. I'll let Ray talk first about the Japan tourism. You know, we've got a great... Um, history in Japan to Hawaii. Japan to yeah, Hawaii. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a one-minute summary. Uh, as you know, um, uh, there's been a long history of Japanese immigration to Hawaii, starting from the 1870s uh, in the Meiji era, uh, era. My grandparents came here in 1907 to Maui. And so, uh, and then the war, of course, stopped uh, such immigration and <clears throat> had an impact on, on Japanese um, uh, coming to Hawaii. And because Japan re was recovering from the war, it really did not have the money, didn't have uh, the way to get out and travel. And then comes the 70s when Japan becomes a powerhouse uh, in, in the economic world order. By the early 80s, what's happening is the yen gets uh, uh, widely appreciated um, against the dollar. It used to be 360 60 to a dollar, it dropped down to 120. And the liberalization of uh, passports. People could finally travel outside of Japan. You could not get a passport for many, many years. So those combination of, of uh, currency the, uh, and, and globalization uh, and, uh, it was the tsunami to Hawaii uh, during, the, during the 80s. And that led to uh, many of the downtown uh, buildings, uh, real estate, uh, kahala, uh, homes, of course, hotels, lots of investment, golf courses, and so forth. And leads up to 1997. 2.2 million tourists, Japanese tourists, uh, a year coming to Hawaii. That was the uh, zenith there. And then comes the 2000s, where there's a kind of a slump in Japanese uh, tourism. And then 2008 comes the Lehman shock. And 2015 we're, and 2016, we're trying to come up to uh, 1.8, 1.9 million again. So, and Japanese still are repeat visitors now. They're like 60% of all Japanese visitors are repeaters. They come to Hawaii two, three times a year. It's no longer just young people, because young people, we'll get to this, are finding other places, more exciting places to go but older people uh, people with families they have been here since the 80s and will continue to come to Hawaii but there's another thing that we are uh, in Hawaii have not been witnessing and this is where Russell and I will uh, try to uh, explore is how the Japan China interaction have been happening Chinese tourists to Japan now that's a very interesting uh, phenomenon and that's what we will explore more because there's lessons in there for Hawaii and changes mm -hmm. Yes. Russell? Uh, Ray has done a great summation of the Japanese history of Hawaii. Um, I won't digress too much on that, but I just want to say that, um, you know, first of all, I think Hawaii would have been blessed and continue to be blessed by the Japanese tourists that come here. We are very grateful for that, 
for our Hawaii tourism. But we've noticed a, a phenomenal trend that the Chinese tourists are uh, really uh, the big next group that has been traveling around the world. Uh, I, I've gone with Chinese tour groups actually to Europe uh, and other places, and um, they seem to be very big spenders. My first experience was going to Europe, and we had a busload, and we went to the um, Rolex store in Switzerland, and there were five floors. There were no Europeans, no Americans, one Caucasian person. I don't know where it's from. <laughs> Rest are Chinese, and everyone spoke Chinese. They hired students to speak uh, the, the Chinese, and, and people on the tour were buying like five Rolex watches. Ooh, and this oh. reminds me of the, the Japan right, when the, they first came to yeah, Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. You know, Louis early Vuitton, days. early yeah. days. And, right. and so, so there's an opportunity here that we have in Hawaii. And, and I'm a little selfish. I want our Hawaii community to benefit from this, this next big global shift tourist um, and so we're seeing the Chinese coming here um, uh, and, and in fact the Hawaii Tourism Authority has a great conference coming up um, end of September and if let's somebody, talk about that when sure. is it what is it September 26th to 29th and some of the important uh, tour travel tourism industry people are going to be in here in Hawaii and uh, if you haven't uh, signed up for it you still can sign up and register for it it's going to be a great event not only will we have discussions about the Japanese tour travel but also something new. It's going to be a whole day on the China business development track. And this is good <coughs> for a community to understand who are the Chinese consumers, what are their expectations, mm. and how do we build business platforms here for our community. And I think this will be very beneficial to our community. So You're going to be there? Also? I'll be there. Um, I'm not the expert. I'm going to be moderating the uh, China mm. track. That's on September 29th. So do sign up for it. Um, just Where a fast, do you sign up? You can sign up. Uh, Hawaii Tourism Authority, uh, there's a page on that for the 2016 conference. Mm -hmm. um, it's not too late from what I understand. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, w just resonating with Ray said, and I want to quickly we're, end that, um, is that we're getting a lot of Chinese travelers, and they're not only coming to Hawaii, but, you know, it's a phenomenon that they're flocking to Japan, of all right. places. And Ray and I were discussing why are they doing that, you know, and, and, and um, Ray can tell you his observations. Well, well yeah, so, so um, first of all, it's close to uh, Beijing, Shanghai. Within uh, several hours, you can travel to Tokyo. Uh, that's number one. Or it's even closer to go to uh, other cities like Fukuoka or Hiroshima or Nagasaki in the southern place and so forth. Uh, there's been a huge ramp up in Chinese Mandarin speaking, uh, Putonghua speaking uh, salespeople at department stores. They have whole floors dedicated to what the Chinese are looking for, which is heavily in electronics. They love electronics, and they, uh, they have their own electronics. Though, but the brand names of a Sony, they can buy a higher uh, or Huawei, uh, uh, you know, uh, rice cooker in in Beijing. But they will show a Sony one to their friends and neighbors and say, <laughs> "Wow, well, look at look at this high tech uh, gizmo that I just got, and you know, this does this, this, and this, and you don't have it." So, so there's a brand. Uh, Chinese uh, love brands. I mean, and they're very cognizant of brands, and they've been exposed to Hong. Kong. Hong uh, brand, uh, brands in Hong Kong, of course, there's a lot of Cartiers and Louis Vuittons in Ch Beijing today, in Shanghai. There's more of that, I think, than in Honolulu. Is uh, the price better in Shanghai? What's that? Is the price better in Shanghai or in uh, Tokyo? Uh, Tokyo's higher. Sure. <laughs> but but the, the fact that they paid more means that they have more money to spend themselves. <laughs> okay. They're rich. <laughs> they want to show people, you know, that they, they can they have the money. Yeah. So so it's a one upmanship, and then it's it's like any other place. But the other thing that the Chinese uh, are going to. Uh, areas where we don't think of, and the northernmost island, which looks just like Western Washington or Canada, is Hokkaido. And that's where my late mother's from, and they're all over the place. And it was sparked by a light comedy movie called If Only You Are from, by uh, a director, Fan Shaogan. And it's a very light comedy, and it uh, starred Chinese young couples in Abashidi, Akang, and, and areas of, of Hokkaido. It started a boom of Chinese. And they love, uh, of course, the beauty and natural you know, uh, resources uh, of evergreens and uh, uh, mountains, and uh, uh, seafood and so forth that they can't get back in China. And this started a boom. Uh, and, um, uh, and it's kind of a branding thing. Hokkaido didn't realize it, but it, it led to a boom. And, and so uh, it is now a, a, like uh, a lot of, of tourism uh, is starting. It's not, so I'm saying it's, it's uh, 
uh, not only on the high end, you know, luxury items, they also for a cultural and, and you know, really a natural kind of experience mm -hmm. that they want to. You know, uh, you know, five or ten years ago, it was not thus. Mm -hmm. Five or ten years ago, I remember there was an incident in a soccer game. Um, I can't remember whether it was in China or Japan, where they were arguing uh, with a kind of a mini riot already. Uh, there was animosity between the two countries all about World War II. Mm -hmm. um, now that seems to have dissipated. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have a dynamic here. It's yes. changing right now. Am I right? Right. Well, you know what I've noticed uh, uh, is that what we're really looking at is it's a people's to people relationship that is going to override anything. Governments will do what they want to do. But I think people to people and engagement, I think, has been very important. Um, let's look at this current Olympics in Rio de Janeiro. One of the um, major, the Chinese were supporting was Ai Fukuhara, and she spoke Mandarin. Right. And, and they were actually cheering her on and felt sorry that she lost. You know, and, you know, so again, it's a real people to people relationship, and that's what we're seeing. Um, for example, in my office, the, 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 all the workers, sectors all want to go to Tokyo to go shopping whenever there's a short holiday. It's close, it's easy to get to, uh, and uh, of course, you know, they want a good product. And so they know there's a lot of great electronics in Japan, uh, Louis Vuitton, and so forth. But again, um, I think these are lessons that we can somehow parlay and how we view the Chinese tourist. How do they coexist with the, our Japanese tourism base? And I think it's all workable. Um, and it's understanding the cultural differences, understanding, yes, there are differences, but the commonalities are more important. Okay, well, I w I'd like to ask one question before we take the break, and that is, is this reciprocal? Um, are there a lot of Japanese tourists visiting China? What, what do they go to do? What do they go to see? Um, are they doing the same thing in reverse or something different? Well, I think Japanese uh, are continuing to go to China, but the, it, it's uh, more so in the uh, business end. Uh, there's a lot of business people going all, uh, there's a lot of uh, Japanese factories, especially in the south, uh, in Guangdong uh, uh, province. Uh, there's also cultural that people love to go to uh, Xi'an, to you know, uh, 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 Hangzhou, very historic places. How, uh, the interesting thing is there's been a rise in s a little bit in resorts like Hainan. You know, uh, it's close by in Japan. So there's some uh, resort activities, but still the resort infrastructure is not that high. Remember, it, it's been the last 10, 15 years when there's been a middle class, uh, right? They can have their car. Finally, it's like uh, post-World War II when you had motels and hotels and people went to Yellowstone, right, in, in, in uh, the mainland U.S. It's very similar to people finally have leisure time, people have money and there's an internal uh, um, kind of uh, resort uh, infrastructure developing but, but the Japanese still go uh, to uh, uh, areas and uh, interesting love there are older people who used to live in the cities uh, uh, before the war and Dalian for example the mayor of Dalian has been exceptional in promoting that city to uh, former residents of Dalian from Japan and with, with that, those friendship visits came Canon, Sony, Panasonic, R&D. Uh, and they employed thousands and thousands of people in Dalian. And Dalian, one of the few cities where I meet Japanese speakers downtown. So there is a lot of people-to-people -people interaction. It's so interesting, people-to-people. Yes. -people. When you yep. say that, you, <clears throat> you're not talking about diplomacy. You're not talking about foreign policy on either side. You're not talking about you know, the, the, the global tensions, if you will, especially around the South China Seas. Um, but what you are talking about, what I get from you, is that we need to look at this in the context of Hawaii. Hawaii right. has to understand this and participate in whatever the process. And that's why we're going to take a break, so we can get to that topic immediately after the break. I can hardly wait. Yeah. I can hardly wait, Jay. I was about to say a few words. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with The Economy and You, and I'd like to invite you each week to come watch my show each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Hello, I'm Crystal from Quok Talk. I've got a new show here. You've got to tune in, check out my topics on sensitive, provocative female issues. So, Tuesday mornings, 10 o'clock. Don't miss it. It's going to be fun and dangerous. Welcome to ThinkCatHawaii.com. This is Johnson Choi. I'm the host for the weekly 
Thursday, 11 o'clock show called Asian Review. See you next month. Aloha and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. I am Ina Chang. I am the guest host for Small Business Hawaii with Raj Baker. Tune in every Thursday at 2 p.m. and watch us. Aloha. We're back, I told you. Russell, your turn. Yes. I just wanted to follow up what you were saying, Jay, and what uh, Ray has talked about, the, the Japanese in, in China. Um, I've witnessed a, a trend that's really important, and that's a lot of the Japanese lifestyle uh, retail is, is coming to China and doing very well. Uniqlo, for example, clothing, lifestyle, Muji. I mean, the Chinese go there, buy your suitcases or your things because it's a better quality. It's a lifestyle store. Um, in fact, some of the Japanese supermarkets, Eon, uh, Ito Yokaido, the Chinese middle class like to go to the Japanese store because they know it's well managed. Mm -hmm. They know that what they're getting is packaged well. They, you know, they operate, they're managed well. Mm -hmm. So again, um, we're seeing a lot of, of interaction on a daily basis between, I think, the people. The Japanese and the Chinese. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm positive, very positive, you know, um, and that's the key. And I think looking at that, how do we take that positive uh, relationship and how do we figure to get the Chinese tourists here and Japanese tourists, you know, they've been together. together. And, and I, I think it's, it's, it's a no-brainer because when I catch a bus, uh, my last trip I was in Haneda, I caught the bu airport bus to Kikujoji in Tokyo, and um, I was shocked. <laughs> there were Mandarin tapes on the bus, and there were a lot of Chinese-speaking people, and they were all talking about they're excited to get into Tokyo, to go shopping, to, to buy gifts for their friends, or to buy this thing, you know. Uh, and, and it's I, a beautiful I, thing. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, but you know what? That's the reality. That's the global reality. You know, we're tied in much more closer than we think is because we have Internet, and we have, it's a global world. You know, and the Chinese can read the bus, even the Japanese kanji, they can figure it out. <laughs> this character is similar, and, you know, they make their way around. But it, it's fascinating to see that. Um, and so I think that, you know, I think maybe, I, I hate to say this, Ray, but you talked about the Meiji era when the first Japanese came here. The Chinese came a little before that. But I think, I, I, I can speak for the Chinese community, the local Chinese. We have this way back old, 100 plus years, Chinese thinking. Here it's frozen in time, yeah. and similar, I think, for the uh, our local Japanese here, a community we have a Meiji era, kind of. <laughs> that was the last time you, you see. Uh, so, so and Ray can elaborate right. that, but, so but again, fast forward, yeah, right. fast forward. You know, here we are. It's a global world, and so we need to to, to look at that. You know, my mentor's uh, uh, former governor Yoshi, and he was right on point. He wanted to make Hawaii international. And international means we kind of change our product to cater some foreign market. But the internet came along. So now it's a global age. A global age is we don't change our content and we take our content to every market. You know, aloha, what does it mean to Chinese? What does it mean to Japanese? What does it mean to Europeans? It's going to be the same thing like Starbucks. People have an expectation that I'm going to get my latte or Americana. It's going to taste this way. Big Mac, American, I'm in Beijing it's going to taste the same. Uh -huh. That's globalism. <laughs> so. Ray, does he excite you the same way he excites me? Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I just want to add that Ray's always excited. what, what <laughs> he's uh, trying to say, and I think it's a very good point, is that there's more overlap between young people in China and Japan than there's a division. They're interested in the same K-pop or, or Japanese singers or Chinese, Hong Kong singers. I mean, there's a lot of overlap. They're interested in global brands, uh, uh, in deep interest in health, in, in the environment. Uh, in, and, and I think these are like, uh, you know, young people everywhere in the globe, but they're a rising force in the, in the economy with money to spend. The other thing about Japan that's a little unique than China, that I just want to add, is that uh, there's been interest in Hawaiian music for the last 50, 60 years, uh, even before that. Uh, so uh, during the last 20 years, um, there's been a huge resurgence of uh, 
of, uh, of Japanese learning the hula and music. And, and there's may, maybe 600,000 uh, in Japan. There are shops devoted to hula, you know, uh, uh, materials and, mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a very unique uh, niche. Uh, I think it may, uh, or, uh, and that, uh, how to get that going in China in a similar way will be very, very fascinating because remember we can export uh, ideas and one of the greatest exports, although we're in the Middle Pacific, is things on aloha, on pono, on the environment, on oceans. These are uh, things that people, uh, young people in Shanghai, Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea all are interested in. So uh, it's absolutely right that uh, you know we cannot uh, uh, we cannot see uh, you know this is eyes on uh, uh, China and Japan, but we cannot see from Hawaii a lens to view Asia or China and Japan through the, through the 19th century. <laughs> it has to be the 21st century. Yeah. And I'll add to that, and, and Ray's direct point, that's what we call globalism. We've taken our aloha, we've taken our music, and it's in Japan. I was the other day walking my dog on Magic Island, and I bumped into a fellow visitor in Japan, and he was playing the ukulele. He played it pretty right, good. Right. And I was talking to him, and he said he's learned it for months, and he's come to Hawaii because he loves the music. You know, And that's what we talk about, global, our culture. Our, our love for the islands, the music, oh, so forth. And, and I, I didn't. I don't have my cell phone with me. I was going to show you the picture. Yes. Um, I take ukulele lessons in China, in Beijing. There's a street called Xinjiakou, and you will see shops lined with ukuleles. <coughs> Even in the local music stores around the country, they sell ukuleles. The kids learn oh. to play ukulele in school. But they don't know. They haven't tied it together Hawaii. <laughs> so bring on Brother Jake. They know who you are, Jake. I had a fellow student, and she said she admires Jake, our Jake, so I mean the Pied Piper. Right. So again, you know, taking advantage of this. And why is it important? Because when you take the music, you take the culture. They know Brother is. Yes, they love uh, Over the Rainbow. Right. Um, sure. That's a big song hit yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And you, you take that. We take what we have here. They will love it. They will come here. And the beautiful thing about it, I'm sure Japan's the same as in China, it's a family culture. So the kid plays the ukulele, so they're going to bring the parents, and they're going to bring the grandparents. So the family travels to Hawaii, you know, it's a family experience. But again, there's a lot of things that, 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 that we see because we are there. And, and we understand, and we look the reverse way. So, so there's some great opportunity. Well, it there. sounds like they are recognizing the value of Hawaii culture perhaps more than we are working to get them <laughs> to recognize it. And my question to you now, and we have five minutes left, is uh, what affirmative steps do we here in Hawaii take in order to facilitate, expedite this cultural exchange you're talking about? I'll let you go right first. It's well, uh, I think uh, it, a lot of more grassroots uh, level activities uh, through uh, sister schools would be one area that I could see uh, happening. Um, uh, the other thing is uh, quite, um, you know, simple, uh, but yet very challenging uh, to have a uh, movie uh, 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 with Chinese young people, a couple and their, uh, their you know, great adventures in Waikiki. Great and, idea, you know, Ray. Maui. Great and, idea. And, 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 and uh, show this uh, in, in throughout China. That is an unbelievable well, uh, you know, a spark, a trigger uh, mm -hmm. for uh, tourism to, to Hawaii. And, uh, and and so I, th I think I in the movie, if there's uh, you know uh, local people, local actors or actresses or musicians or whoever who are in the movie, it really shows a human side uh, to Hawaii, and the society is welcoming. Uh, that there's uh, fun things to do, and there's uh, people who are uh, uh, ready to share culture and language. And we have a million stories. You yeah, know, that's right. The Descendants, for yeah, example, yeah. relatively successful movie. One story. We have thousands and thousands of stories, of melting pot stories, which appeal to people everywhere. Yeah. Yes, and I, I follow I echo what Ray has said. I think having a TV series. There was a very popular TV series in China that turned into a movie about romance in Thailand, which oh. fueled a lot of travel <laughs> to Thailand. Um, and uh, my classmate, Chris Lee, who was in the movie business, is, I know he's been working on that, so, sort of like that, on a project. But that's the thing. I, the second thing, what's important is we need to, to somehow get kids here to learn Mandarin. Uh, in Chicago and other places, they have a big program to mm -hmm. learn Mandarin. I was talking to the Chicago, UH, yeah. uh, UH about wow. the students taking Mandarin, and it was sad because there was enough room for the elementary Mandarin. So I think as a government, we need to kind of 
advocate some of these things because to get the Japanese tourism, right. we have a great language base here. Right. And you know what it is? It's making them feel friendly when they come here. And it's also a sign of respect. It's face. You give them face when you have people that can speak your language. Even if just you say ni hao. They feel wonderful about it, you know. Yeah. Second thing and you is you get a return on investment. Yes, yes. I mean, this this yields enormous benefits for us. And, and second thing, uh, this is a lo little long range thinking. Not only the high schools. I was in a meeting the other day with another private high school, and they have a Chinese program. They have about a third of their foreign students are from China, and we're going to see more of that. And uh, again, the interaction is great. Um, and I think the, the university system here. I think if we brought in more engineers and high-tech people from China, you know, even the ones that they don't get into MIT at the beginning here, they're very smart kids. They bring relationships here. They bring relationships, and they also bring a, 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 a pool of resources here. Our kids will get to learn how they do business in Asia, how they act, or customs. They will develop relationships. And who knows? Intel went to Austin. They were, they were picking Hawaii over Austin years ago. Maybe they'll come back when they can do a joint venture. We can be a R&D center for a lot of high tech. We, we don't do manufacturing, but R&D again, and, and bring in that talent from Asia, Japan, China, and wrapping the enrollment so our kids will also learn how to compete globally and learn another language. So you're going to you're going to leave the studio. You're going to go out, you know, outside on Bishop Street. What are you going to do to make this happen? We're going to be back here again, Jay. <laughs> we're going to be back here, and we're going to push this show, Jay. Repetitio mater studiorum. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Ray, you had something? Yes, and, and uh, Russ is uh, uh, completely right that there are many places that we don't think about have nothing to do with China, like Minnetonka, Minnesota, Fairfax, Virginia, many, many places that have Chinese immersion schools from kindergarten. And their parents don't speak Mandarin, but uh, uh, they know the future. The future is in business uh, between China and, and the U.S. and globally. So um, uh, we, we really have to um, uh, leverage this, that what we have, uh, you know, we just have to say we are going to compete with, with, the, with mainland cities, oddly enough. And there are other mainland cities that have medical tourism. They have a uh, hospital set up to take care of uh, wealthy, independent, you know, uh, Chinese who come. And they have interpreters, uh, you know, DVDs, Chinese food, the, the whole infrastructure of, of catering to uh, medical uh, medical tourism. That's a whole other field that that we are not really um, exploiting. You're looking at it from the point of view of um, people getting together, people to people, mm -hmm. but it also has a. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, a, an indirect and probably also a direct um, relation or an effect on diplomatic relations between the two countries. It's a natural, one follows the other, you know. If you get to know the other guy, you're going to like him. If you get to know the other guy's culture, you're going you're gonna to blend that, you're going to meld that, you're going to become friends. Um, isn't that part of what you're saying? Yes. And remember, in Hawaiian, Oahu means I believe the gathering place. <laughs> Good point. The, the gathering place. And this is a great gathering place. And I think of course, these are bold steps for many people who have not traveled extensively and lived abroad. But I think, I think we're in a global age. We're going to have to take some risk. And and we're, we're, our, otherwise, everything will pass us again. These are the global guys. <laughs> Ray Tsuchiyama, informed citizen and more. Uh, and uh, Russell Liu uh, from Shepherd Mullen, who spent 13 years practicing law in China. Fabulous. Here on Asia in Review, eyes on China and Japan. They'll be back every two weeks. Wonderful to have you guys here. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Much.